Thank you for sticking around. I know this is late, it's Friday. A lot of you have to travel, so I um, thank you for being here. I hope you had a great time. Uh, yes, of course, we left um, the last session of the day to the, to the math session, right? This is a, so I, I know you're fighting, fighting sort of sleep, and a lot of you went out last night, and you're fighting hangovers, so I thank you for sticking around. Um, my name's Troy McGuinness. I run a, a small consulting firm basically on risk management and quantitative analysis. And one of the areas which I've been doing a lot with lately is working with companies on modeling their portfolio and modeling their, uh, their software process to try and find out what areas would give the biggest bang for the buck if they could improve one area. And that's what I'm sort of summing up in the title of Cycle Time Analytics. Um, now, there's going to be some numbers shown, and I know even though you're at school desks, um, you don't have to write this down. If you go to bit.ly slash agile sim, you can actually get this presentation right now uh, without having to uh, take notes furiously or take photos of the screen. Um, my Twitter handle is um, T underscore McGuinness. Um, you know, you don't have to follow me, but uh, if you want to sort of continue the discussion about how, this, how I'm progressing with this work and how others are handling it, um, feel free to add me to your list. So I'm going to start with one, one problem. Now, the thing about statistics is it's taught very poorly in schools. It's all taught about standard deviation and variance and, and large formulas and numbers, which tend to freak people out. But I think a statistics is more of a logic problem than a math problem. And it, you know, it has to have an actual uh, real-world use. So I'm just going to start off with a few quick little questions for you to try and get you to understand uncertainty uh, better than you probably do from your, from your education. And the first example I'm going to give is a real-world example of during World War II where we needed to estimate how many tanks were uh, actually on the ground in, uh, in, in uh, Germany and, and other countries which were occupied at the time. Because the intelligence estimates, you know, I, I guess the NSA went around at the time so they couldn't read anybody's emails, but the estimates at the time said that there were about 10,000 tanks on the ground. And that didn't feel right to some statisticians who were working this problem. So they had to come up with some basic ways of doing it. And I'm going to explain how they did it here. This, is, this process is still in use today. It's still in, you know, how, when you try and work out how many products your competitors have actually manufactured, this is the process which is applied uh, quite often in, in, in to actually do that analysis. And what it's called is prediction intervals where you know there's a real sample, there's, a, there's actually a real world number of items in the world. Uh, you don't, can't get access to them all, you can just get access to a subset of the samples. And the question comes that if out of the samples I have in hand, what is the chance that the next sample I take or get is within the boundaries of what I've seen? Because what we're trying to discover is the actual maximum and the actual minimum, but we're trying to do that just by taking small samples from an actual set of values. Now, in World War II, that was serial numbers off the tanks, and then they, they stopped putting serial numbers on the tanks, but the gearbox manufacturer left serial numbers on the gearbox. So what the, uh, what the statisticians did was they got people to go out into the field whenever a tank was captured and write down the serial numbers. Uh, and, of course, being German, they were very precise, and they were always numerically in order. They never skipped any any numbers, there was a perfect range. So the question is, is I have three samples in hand that I've taken from the world, and I have a fourth sample that I'm about to take. What is the chance that sample number four is between above the value number one, which is the minimum, the lowest minimum we've seen so far, and sample number two, which is the highest that we've seen so far? Now you can work this out with absolutely no math whatsoever. There's, nothing, there's no trickery here, there's no, no great formula. Well, what do we know? Well, all we really know is that it could be in one of four spots. It could be below one, it could be between one and three, it could be between three and two, it could be above two. And because we don't know anything about this, this uh, actual samples that we have, we just know that they're from a serial set of numbers, we have to assume there's an equal probability that it could occur in each space. So, we give them each 25% chance, 25, 25, 25. So, by having three samples, we're actually 50% sure that the next sample is going to be between the range that we've previously seen. And that's exactly what they did. And then they found out it was only, uh, I think, you could Google the German tank problem on Wikipedia, uh, you'll find out the exact numbers, but it was like about 300. And after the war, they found out there was actually at that date 350. 
much less than 10,000. So even with three samples, that really changed the tactics that were used during the war, because thinking that you're going in facing 10,000 tanks versus facing a couple of hundred tanks changes your strategy. So when, when people say that they don't have enough data to make, uh, to make a decision, it's not statistically significant, um, okay, this is being recorded, but I'll say it anyway, that's bullshit, right? You need very few samples. It's actually your very first few samples that reduce most uncertainty in any, any analysis you do. So when we, when we increase that out and we just keep running the permutations, the same story holds true. By 11 samples, we're 90% sure. There will only be 5% expectation that the next sample will be above the highest you've seen and 5% sample that it's going to be below that you've seen. So uh, this is sort of summed up in a book um, by a professor in, in Sydney on the mathematics of sex, and she says quite categorically that you should marry the 11th person you date. Because by the 11th person you date, you know that there's only a 5% chance that you haven't seen someone worse. <laughs> so that's just simple, simple logic. You see, there was no real math there. It was just that, well, what do we know and what don't we know? And if we don't know anything about the underlying distribution, let's just uniformly distribute our uncertainty and see where we are. So how might this works when you actually have access to real data? Sometimes it's the first time the event has occurred. So you have no real historical data. So what do you do in that case? And what we do in statistics and decision theory is we, we sort of start running simulations. In other words, we invent samples, but we invent them in a way which we can actually still make some uh, educated guesses on. So here's a classic, and this one's very related to software. If you've got four people who are going out to a restaurant after work, what's the chance that they are, arrive on time for an on-time seating? So you've got four people. Anyone want to make a guess at what's, what's the a one in X probability that they'll seat on time? Anyone got an idea? 60%? 25. 25, all right. So what we're going to do now is the process which we're going to use is, is if I just draw out every permutation of someone being late, so a red square is, means that that person arrived late and inhibited you seating on time, and green meant that you actually arrived in time for your seating. Well, the interesting thing is, guys, there was a 1 in 16 chance that you actually get seated on time. So that's why you always arrange to meet in the bar for drinks beforehand. A, it's fun. B, it reduces your risk. So all we did here is we just sort of said, what's the chance of getting four people to a restaurant on time? What's the chance of getting four stories through exactly on the time that you originally estimate them being done? It's one chance in two to the power of n stories you're attempting. So that's the odds that we're dealing with every day when we're trying to build software and deal with external teams and start to coordinate the work between those team members. It's a very hard problem to solve and the odds are against you, which is why you need good systems in place to solve and reduce that risk. How did I reduce the risk in this case? Tell them to meet in the bar 15 minutes earlier. Um, a, you'll be quite drunk and the dinner conversation will flow better. B, you will actually start on time. So you think this is more complex and you think that the whole world of uh, that, that simulation doesn't play out in the real world. And this is a great infographic from um, the New York Times. They did before the election, uh, the 2012 re-election of, of uh, presidential candidates in, in the US. And what they did was they worked out how many simulated chances from all the combinations would cause Obama to win versus Romney to win. So, all this data is commonly available, right? Uh, the US doesn't run on a, on a preferential voting system. They run on a, on a winner-take-all um, electoral college system where each state has a certain number of, of actual votes that they actually put towards the, uh, the electoral candidate. And it's different states do it slightly differently, but normally um, you know, the state puts all its bets on one candidate, depending on how the, vote, the popular vote turned out into that state. So what these smart guys did was they worked out how many of those votes, how many, and each of these little blue ticks would be an Obama win and a red Terminator, a red tick would be a, uh, a Republican win. It was Romney who was the candidate at the time. And all they did was play out every scenario that was possible to occur of the states that were still in play, the states that, was, that the telephone polling 
uh, didn't sort of say it was a, a foregone conclusion. And there's a lot of states in the US where it's, all, it's a foregone conclusion before they elect. So this is what they did. They actually just sort of said, well, for Obama to win, if he wins Florida and he wins Ohio, he's president. If Romney wins Florida, well, he goes off the, yeah, he doesn't have a pathway. What you found with Romney is he had to win multiple states in concert to actually become president. And that's why what they come out in the public and said before the election, there was an 84% chance, 84% chance that Obama was going to win. Now what we don't know in those states is what is the probability that um, we can actually swing the vote. And what, even given this data, even what you've just seen, which is publicly available and every, every political science student sort of studies at nauseum, is what it affects is where you spend your money. And this is the top 10 states which were funded by, uh, by uh, the Democratic, which was um, President Obama and, and uh, Governor Romney. It's how many millions of dollars they spend on each state in advertising. And you'll sort of see that it pretty much lines up to the, the top five states, which were the deciding states in, in the election. So what we're trying to do when we do statistics and we don't have data is we're trying to hypothetically simulate all the possible combinations and count how many are in favour of one answer or favour of another and then work out a strategy of how we're going to spend our money to cause, uh, cause this to occur. In this case, uh, it looks like at some point in time the um, Obama camp gave up on Florida and said we're going to lose it anyway, let's spend our money somewhere else. That's why they spent 78. Or maybe Romney increased his spending in Florida because it was so important. If he lost Florida, he lost the election. So you'll see that's why he spent the most money on that state. Virginia is an outlier. That eventually went to um, Obama. Uh, you'll see they're pretty much equal in Ohio, but, um, but Obama came through in the end. In the end, it... it uh, Obama won by, I think, Virginia or Wisconsin. It never went below this in that, in that simulation tree. But you guys now qualify to, to do sort of be a quantitative analyst for any political party during re-election. That's exactly how you work out how you're going to fund campaigns and when to spend the money. So well done. Now, a simulation we can do, which might be closer to home, is the no estimates sort of debate and conversation, that all estimation is waste, so let's not do it at all. Well, this, this matches my mental model. I sort of thought, well, let me sit down and sort of see if I could do a simulation on, uh, on how things go, how would that work? So I sort of said, if there are two states where you've got the highest paid person's opinion and you're going to do it anyway, if the team size is fixed and it exists, you don't need to estimate. If you're being told that it's the next thing you're going to do and you're going to do it anyway and you can't hire any more people to change the date, then there's no need to spend any time estimating how long it's going to take to do that work at all. Just go and do it. But if the date's fixed or it's a new team and you don't have any data about, um, and there is some flexibility in being able to hire new staff, well, now you need to work out what skill set you want and how many people you need, which is a form of an estimate, which is in blue. So no estimate results are in yellow, and estimate results of the forecast of some type are in blue. Now, when someone uses an economic prioritization process like cost of delay or weighted shorter of job first, things get a bit more interesting. But again, if the date's fixed and you have a new team, even though someone said or it was decided mathematically that it's the next thing you're going to do, you still have a chance to influence the number of people on the team and change the date outcome. But if the team is fixed and you can't change that, uh, then what you, you're not forecasting people now, you're trying to give someone an indication of when it's going to be delivered. Again, that's a type of forecast. But if someone doesn't have a, a value for cost of delay or the value is uh, unknown, then your estimate may as well be foggy. You don't have to give be precise. If they're not going to be precise with how important it is to do, then they're not using duration as a factor in prioritization at all, then it, you may as well just give them a foggy estimate. So there you go, a 70% chance you need to forecast, just like we did in the election. There you go, mathematical proof that you, no estimates works 30% um, of the time and estimating works 70% of the time. 
Now, I use this as an example in jest, right? Your process will change, but what you want to try and do when someone says you should do X is work out how many possible permutations or cases that makes sense for versus not make sense for and place your bets accordingly. So, that's what forecasts are. Forecasts are attempts to answer questions that of events which haven't occurred yet and the difference between an estimate and a forecast is that you state the uncertainty of the answer you're giving. And that's one thing you need to be really careful of is that sometimes if someone will just say, you would have changed my mind once it got above a month, but instead we have large groups of people sitting down trying to work out it's going to be 3.275 months. When someone asks you to estimate or forecast, ask them what point would sway their decision and stop doing that estimate and forecasting the moment that you hit that point. Don't keep going. I think that's where we need to, uh, we need to remind um, the no estimation sort of people is that not with very few samples, in fact three, we could be 50% certain of how many tanks there were in Germany. Um, you know, the strategy between less than 1,000 tanks and less than 10,000 tanks probably would have been enough. So by 50% sure, even if you were 50% wrong, even if you doubled it at 350 and it was still under 1,000, you only need to take three samples of tanks to know what you're going into in a, in, in a battlefield. So know the, how little data you need. So that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do with forecasting, is we're trying to put a bounded, a bounded estimate around it. We're trying to sort of say, just like we say with weather forecasting, we say there's a 50% or 80% chance of rain. What that means is on their numerical models, 80% of those model outcomes said rain. It's still possible that the other 20% said that there was no rain actually were right. You don't know that yet. Only time will tell. So that's the answer. There's never a single forecast result. There's never a single estimate you can give. There's always many. And what we're trying to do with quantitative forecasting is we're trying to find out which ones are more likely than others uh, and then express that uncertainty so that the person hearing that number in forecast can make an educated guess or decision on that data. Any questions so far? Damn. Yeah, well, that's the logic, yeah. It's not quite right. That's a very good point. And it's a point I absolutely hate. Um, you'll see in risk management where they multiply the exposure by uncertainty and they come up with a, with a number. Well, that's very contextual, sensitive, right? I mean, if it's a devastating result, maybe even a 1% likelihood, if there's, even if there's a 1% likelihood of losing a million dollars, that might be, that 1% might you need to mitigate it if it's going to be a devastating event. So the, the very quick math that people do in multiplying likelihood by exposure is um, a very, very rough guide. So yes, I probably would have gone four samples to see what the difference between 50% and 63% was and used that as the, the amount I would double or multiply. Yeah, that, that's correct. So, he's, so Andy's point is, is that uh, just because your 20% of your model said you were wrong doesn't mean that um, you're out by 20%. Um, but that's the common heuristic that's used to work out your exposure. You multiply the amount that you think you're wrong by the actual total exposure and work out what that, what that gap is. It's flawed in most cases, including anything you read on risk management which uses a matrix that has uh, likelihood is, um, is incorrect, and I'm still going through counseling, so we're not gonna bring it up. Uh, great, great question. So, one of the things we're trying to do with probabilistic forecasting is combine multiple uncertain things together to find out what the range of possible outcomes are, and the quick way people do this is they sum up everything and divide it by the number and give an average right in the center well, the problem with that is, is that 50% of the outcomes were above that and 50% were below. So if you've got a linear regression line on a burn-up chart and so forth, what that running average is actually giving you is 50% of the values will be above it and 50% of the values will be below it. Now, if you were running an election campaign and taking, I don't know, about $1.2 billion of funds, 
You don't want a 50% chance of winning or losing. You don't want a towing cost chance. You want to increase your odds. You want to be above a certain amount of extra value to actually uh, make certain that your result is in your favor. So this is what's called the floor of averages. And you'll see a lot of cases where people make decisions based on an average value and then don't understand why, um, why they lost. Well, they had a 50% chance of losing. And what we're trying to do with probabilistic forecasting is um, increase the odds better than 50% in a, in a knowledgeable way. The book, The Floor of Averages, is a must read to buy your boss uh, because it's a, a, a very great introductory level approachable book on understanding uncertainty in the real world. So I suggest that book. So you've seen, yeah, this looks a bit geeky, this is a bit mathy, I, I, I know, I apologize. But essentially, who remembers histograms from school? So from a sample set, the higher the bar, the more frequent that value occurred. And the simple form is a uniform distribution. Think of a six-sided die. There's no difference between the chance of any face of that die turning, uh, turning out unless you buy a special die. And what happens is, is if we sum together rolling, well, in this case, the numbers are between uh, minus 1 and plus 1. If we sum together multiple distributions of a uniform distribution together, if we sum two together, there are more values in the center. It becomes a triangle distribution. The moment we even get to three and four, summing together four numbers with a plus or minus variance will get you pretty close to a, to a normal distribution. And that's why they occur so much in nature and manufacturing. Because if you've got a machine that has multiple tolerances, plus or minus tolerances, on how it uh, injection molds or how it sort of uh, uh, cuts a piece of metal or steel, and you've got that process being done multiple, multiple times, those uncertainties are going to sum to being a normal distribution. Same thing with heights. So you're actually the sum of a set of bones, and those bones grow plus or minus a certain percentage amount each. And that's why we, we, if we sum the heights of the people in this room, there would be a normal distribution. Anytime you sum together something that has a, a value plus a uh, a tolerance, you're going to end up at a normal distribution. So that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, it's, it it's, it's, a, it's one form of what's called the central limit theorem if you want to sort of read about it. So that's one form of uncertainty. When we're doing project work and stories, we're summing together the amount of time it takes to do a bit of work, and that work is uncertain. So we probably should end up uh, something approximating a, a normal distribution at the output. And I'm going to get to why that's wrong later in the talk, but it's good enough for now. Because there's another set of uncertainty. And this is the one that's overlooked by people. They do a forecast, but every time you make a decision about a project team and add a staff member or someone's off sick or something, uh, you make a decision to change the order of work or you've got to deal with a production outage, there's decision-induced uncertainty. In other words, every time you make a decision, you actually change and alter the outcome. and you can use that as something to control, or you can use it as something to complain about. But the point is, is that if we look over here, this is the histogram of uh, the amount of cost of delay, rather. So this is just a bar graph of, of magnitude, the cost of developers, and the number of staff. You know, by changing the number of staff, of course, we increase the dev cost, but we decrease the cost of delay. And it's understanding how all these factors interplay, which is what we should be using to manage our business. And that's where, that's where we, we need to not give a single forecast result. You need to be able to say, um, I can't hit that date with the current staff I have, but if I had these staff members, I can hit this date. Or if you re remove these features. So what this forecasting is about is it's about uncovering the conditions which would allow you to hit something. It's not about forecasting where you are to get a long distance date out in front. That's the popular view of forecasting. But what it's about is understanding what we can do about it. So without further ado, I'm going to sort of show you how I would do this using cycle time in Kanban projects or, or lean projects or anything, really. First thing we need to do is um, we can't run the project a thousand times and see what all the variations of the outcomes are. We don't have that luxury, and uh, we don't have a lot of samples for the work we're going to do. We only have samples for the work we've done previously. 
different amounts, different sizes. So what do we do? We build a model. We, build a, we just build a very simple model, and it doesn't have to be complex. It can be in a spreadsheet. If you were modeling, doing 10 jobs, it might be modeling 10 jobs that you know are going to take between one and five days each. Very simple model, just sum them together over and over and over again. But the thing I want to mention is that models are, give you the ability to run these experiments to uncover these decision points without actually having to do the work on the real object. Crash test dummies in cars, you know, it's, um, you don't want to wait till people have died to sort of say, yeah, we really should have used a bigger bolt on that seatbelt uh, holder. So, now you've got a choice about what depth do you go. You could have a really simple model which just gave you the result of the outcome, like a linear projection line on a burn down chart. But if it didn't hit where you wanted, you wouldn't have any information as to why. You, so now you need the model to get a bit more complex about system cycle time. So now we can at least start sort of seeing what factors might be playing a bigger influence than others on the outcome. And then we can sort of split cycle time up between the design task and the dev task and the DevOps tasks. And now we can start sort of changing them in a controlled fashion one at a time to see which one has the biggest impact and influence. Uh, so rather than summing together 10 jobs with just a one to five cycle time in sequence, we might sum together 10 jobs with three different cycle times for different three tasks to come up with the total number for that cycle time. More to come on that. But that's what you do is you start off with a model which is very simple and you move down to models which are diagnostic. And the same thing happens with the metrics you track. You should probably, you should dashboard the very high level metrics that you want to use for people to, uh, to change behavior in a positive way. Uh, and then there's other metrics that you're going to use to dig into. Why is conversion failing? Why is our website not converting as much anymore? Well, now we want to drill in to sort of see which part of the checkout path we're losing them, or which pages converted last week but are no longer converting. So you always want a suite of metrics or a suite of models moving from the, uh, the simple models of just a projection to give you an answer down into the diagnostic models which tell you why you didn't get the answer you expected. It's a, it, there's a range and you have to make a choice. Now with cycle time, I tend to model, the simplest thing I can think of is just three basic inputs. You, how long it takes to do each piece of work as, uh, as a distribution, as a histogram, a set of samples from prior work, an amount of work you actually have to do, just say number of stories for instance, and how much of that work happens in parallel? What's the work in process? How much whip do you have across the entire Kanban board might be an example. And, and then I add there that there's also uh, random chance and just plain stupidity, which also goes into how projects turn out. You need to control for that. So what you're trying to do, or what we're trying to do with a simple model, again, is we're trying to play out a thousand odd simulations of how a project might run within what we understand historically has occurred and within what our expert judgment says may occur in the future. So the cycle time or lead time, sorry, Andy, um, what, what do we want to call this now, flow time? How long it takes between something starting and finishing, whatever you want to call Time in process. So time in process would be calculated, what, just read time in process here. Um, even if you just, and, and when I started doing this, I used to just write when a post-it note went into the input queue on the board, I used to go and write the date on the left-hand corner of the post-it note, and when it went into the done column, at the, after stand-up, I'd write the completed date on the right-hand corner of the post-it note, and at the end of the week, I would grab the post-it notes and go and type them into Excel. What you end up with is, a set of stories which have started, you look at the board and you write down the ones which had a start date which haven't had an end date yet, and you end up with this sort of set of just, just with these two data points for each story historically that your team has produced, you can start calculating the process, the time in process, thank you. So it's a pretty simple calculation to do, and that gives you your sample set of cycle times or lead times or time in process that you're gonna use for projecting forward. You know, I'm going to have an aneurysm. So the second part of the, the model that you needed, which was outside of your control, which you need samples for, is how much whip you had in process, how much work was accruing cycle time, lead time, or process time at any moment in time. It's a lot of time. <laughs> uh, so that's as simple as you just 
run your finger down the page and you see which ones have started but haven't finished by the date that you're recording on and you just write down the number. And then you end up with this set of samples and what you do is you now grab a, a set of scissors, you print these out and you grab a set of scissors and you cut each square out and you put it in a hat. Now, you need 10 samples to work out how long it's going to take to do 10 bits of work in one simulated run. Grab 10 samples, 10 pieces of paper, every time you take one out, put it back in, just read it off, write it down, and sum them together. And then divide it by the amount of work in process that you have versus an average over that period of time or something like that. That will give you a hypothetical and quite plausible outcome to a piece of to running 10 more stories through this process. Now, why is that better than just actually doing an average and doing a burn down regression? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Do, doing this multiple times, what it gets you is if I just draw your attention down to the bottom right hand corner, is as we just plot or count the number of times a certain number of days turned out to be a result by doing that process over and over again, you'll start seeing a pattern forming. And what that pattern allows us to do is work out how many of these simulated runs we want to, were happened on or before a date, and that tells us how certain we are that the output is actually going to be on or before that date. Just like the weather forecasters did. They run a model a thousand times and they find out that 800 of them actually said it was going to rain. They say they're 80% certain of rain. By doing this multiple times and summing together the uncertainty of what we've historically seen in our process, we actually build the same thing that we can do. We can sort of say out of a thousand runs, 800 of them were on or before um, September the 13th and that was, uh, that's, we're 80% certain we're going to hit the date September the 13th. So that's the process in a nutshell, but you can go mad, right? We used one input there, one uncertain input of historical cycle time, but now you can sort of say, well, we're going to ramp up our staff, so at different periods of time, we're going to have different numbers of staff. And then you can say, you know, we've got options about how much of the backlog we include, so I might just do it for the first feature, second feature, third feature, and all the permutations of those features, because people are going to change their mind on order. You can start looking at how much people add to the backlog over time. So even though you're starting with, with uh, 10 items, it's probably more likely going to be 15 by the time you get to the end of the project. And then you can look at the defect rate, that how much, what's, how, historically, every time we do a feature of a certain size, we end up with five defects, and they're of a certain complexity. And you sort of say, but we're going to start off slow, we're going to hit our stride in the middle, and we're going to follow the standard S curve that software you know, knowledge workers often, often follow. So what we're doing in modeling is we're joining all of these uncertainties together to come up with a hypothetical simulated project completion time, and then we're counting the number that finished on or before a certain date and quoting that as our forecast. But it gets better. Now I can do experiments on this model. I could change the cycle time by 10% and do a forecast. And then I can change the defect rate by 10% and do a forecast. We are returning cycle time back to its normal. Scope creep by 10%. And by doing those experiments of sensitivity, I can find out which inputs cause the biggest impact on the output. And now I know what process to put in place to solve a problem which is going to economically make the biggest impact to the project. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what we try and do when we build these models and we build the diagnostic models. When I say diagnostic, what I mean is we have the ability to run these experiments of what if cycle time did reduce by 10%, what would the outcome be then, eh? And you do that over and over again. And here's a, 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 real, a real one. I, I have a little modeling language which helps you model sort of software projects, and this is the output from a real project. And you'll see it's not a normal or nice, neat little sort of uh, normal distribution. And that's because there's a lot of uncertainty about the amount of work we're going to do in risks and there's a percentage chance that those risks are going to occur. So rather than just multiplying likelihood exposure by that 20% certainty, in this case, what I sort of said, is a 20% certainty scope's going to increase by um, 10 stories, whatever I did in this model, whatever this team sort of said it was going to be. In this case, it was, we think if there is a performance problem, and at the moment we're 25% certain that there, there may be a performance issue which causes us to have to do more rework, I asked the team, 
how much rework would you have to do to hit the, the target if that occurred? And they sort of said, about standard 10 stories more than what we currently have. So what this shows is that although just the normal uncertainty in the work that we know, what we'd normally just sort of say, whether it's a, a 10 point, you know, an eight point story or, a, you know, God, I'm blowing it now, five or eight point story, whatever it is. I don't estimate the story points. But whatever that is, you see it makes a range difference down the bottom here between this range. But if the risk comes true, all these outcomes come into play. So this is what I find quite common in our industry. It, if you can estimate one thing, it's estimating what could go wrong is probably more important than what the uncertainty is on the estimates that you have. You need to ask people, what could stop us shipping? And if that came true, what work would be involved in fixing it? And just historically, I'm finding that is the most sensitive input that I have on the modeling. And because I do these models, what I can do is I can start sort of building a set of values for them. I can ask them to tell me how much risk they're willing to take. In this case, they said 15%. So 85% was the point I, 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 I give them the number. They wanted a single number, so I don't. I hide the distribution from them. I tell them that then 85% chance of hitting 25th of February 2014. That is 74 days beyond where you wanted it to be. And since you told me your cost of delay was, um, I forget what their actual value was, that equates to a $1.214 million loss. And they go, oh my god. And I sort of say, that's not all bad news. If, I, if we add a designer and uh, two testers, that number comes down to, we, we actually hit our target, and one designer and two testers is far less than $1.214 million in cost of delay of not entering the market. So rather than sort of saying, Troy, you need to cut staff by 10% because you're over budget, they sort of say, oh my god, I can't afford not to give you a designer and two testers to bring this project in on time. By having even simple models like this, you actually change the argument of uh, you know, uh, uh, these infantile stupid arguments about um, you know, very small staffing decisions for three months, or no, you can't use contractors, they're too expensive. Well, they're not $1.214 million expensive. Um, and, you know, if we look at this, we actually have an, uh, the x-axis is just date, and the y-axis is the number of completed stories of a, a set of simulation runs, and the band here is how much uncertainty there is in the number of completed stories that all the models showed. So this is, this is an interesting point, and this is if you have to pay attention for one thing, it's, 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 it's this. It, it does grow, but it nowhere near grows the shape of the cone of uncertainty which has been popularized in, in many books. And the reason it doesn't grow at that, it never will grow at that, is the fact that any agile process, and without being struck by lightning, Scrum, for instance, every two weeks, you reset the uncertainty on the project. In other words, after two weeks, you know how many extra stories you got completed. Now, when the cone of, what the cone of uncertainty is based on is that, is that uncertainty grows at the square of the distance. That if you're, if you're hunting for something, and Don Ronaldson does this quite elegantly, he sort of says, if you're a submarine, and they, you have a sighting of a submarine or a sonar uh, finding of a submarine, Every hour, the distance you have to cover is the square of the dis uh, of, uh, it grows by a square factor. So in, in, if the submarine could travel at a 10 miles an hour, in an hour it's traveled 10 miles an hour, but the actual area that you have to do is, um, is uh, 10 to the power of two. It grows, it, it grows uh, at, a, at a square power law factor. So that's what the cone of uncertainty, that's why it grows at that certain rate. That would only be true if you carried your uncertainty for the entire length of the project. If in the submarine case you took another sonar sighting of it, you've reset your uncertainty. You now know where it is and the clock starts again in how to find that submarine. Now, so Scrum does it on an iterative basis. Every two weeks you, you actually have an update about how much progress you've actually made. In Kanban, it's every story that's completed. Every time we complete a story, we've reduced the uncertainty in our understanding of when you're going to complete. 
So that's why it's actually a narrower band than you would actually expect. Um, so it's very important that, that um, every time you get an extra piece of data, you should go back and reanalyze your, your decision, uh, your forecast, and understand where you are now. Because it's an opportunity. What you've done is you've actually gotten more and more certain. And every sample, as you saw in that first sample of how to find the tank using serial numbers, every, it's your first few samples which narrow your uncertainty the most. How am I going? Good. So then I get into, you, you decide to do this, and you want to go in, and you want to implement it on your own set of historical data. And you have historical data. It's midway through a project. Lucky you. Um, this is a very common, a common um, engagement style that I take, is that they, I come in uh, about two-thirds of the way through because they're panicking. Um, and what do I do? I first of all divide the, the data I have, the historical data, into two buckets. So what I do is I start from the start, and I use the first half of the cycle times, and I build a model which accurately forecasted the first three months of the project. And then I test it. I see if that model would have held true for the next three months. So what I'm doing is I'm increasing my confidence that my model just wasn't complete crap, and it just happened to luck out through compensating errors on the exact date that they saw in the first three months. So by the time I've done this test, I've now got confidence that I can forecast forward with some degree of certainty. How much certainty? Well, as soon as another story finishes, I have inputs to see if my model is accurate. Now, my model is going to be wrong. If the actual value which comes in doesn't match what my model said, it's the model that's wrong. I've got to find out why, which input changed in a different way that I didn't expect. It's like a weather forecast. If it ends up not raining, it wasn't the weather system that was wrong. It was the model that sort of said uh, you were, uh, it, wasn't, it, it was going to rain that's wrong. So you, you know, it's, you, it's, it's an iterative process, and you've got to keep tracking actual versus the model. So every time you actually do can count the number of, of, of stories, ideally what should happen is the, the peak of this nice, thin, elegant little bar should be within the bands of uncertainty that the model is showing could occur. In this case, it wasn't. Uh, so they did something drastic, and they might have overreacted a little. It's probably a good thing to do, get a bit ahead. But every, you know, I'd like to see more samples here. I would have liked to see more samples of counting the number of stories in the complete bucket over time. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that your model is matching reality to give you some faith that you can run experiments on that model that will give you great knowledge about how to manage your project better. And when it doesn't match, I tend to pin these things up on someone's wall. All right, we're behind. You know, well, the first level of diagnostics is to look at the different factors. Is our cycle time trend versus the cycle time we modeled, is it going down? You know, green it means a good heading in a good direction, red means heading in a bad direction. And you know, when I look at these, I can pretty much give them a scorecard, you know, oh my god, you're in deep trouble. To uh, yeah, no, you're you're in good shape. Everything's the reason your model um, is behind what you said is because you're just doing good. Everything's uh, running better than expected. I would still fix the model to make it run just um, just ambient, but it's uh, it's a it's a very simple process to work. What one of those three model inputs actually are the ones you need to look at some more. So what happens when you don't have historical data? And this is this is the case a lot of the time when you have a new project or the next project that you have. You need to make a decision. Do I use the historical data from another project, or do I try and infer what those inputs would be? Now, this is where it gets interesting, because cycle time is one I believe we can infer quite accurately. The amount of work we're given and the work in process, I think we can um, pretty much look at the average if the team size is changing. It's, that's not going to change between different projects as much as how long it takes to do the work. So I, being faced with this problem, I had to work out how, how I would fake it until I actually got the real data flowing in. And I, and I uh, sort of needed to understand why the rest of the industry's cycle time data followed certain parameters, certain shapes. So I had a look at all the data I had 
And this is a histogram in the bar charts, and these lines, these colorful lines, are different types of known probability distributions which occur either in nature or in industry that are already known. And the popular one you see is log normal, which I didn't like too much because it was, goes off the screen up here. And a higher value in these probability distributions means that more frequently it will use those numbers in that random range. It'll use too many low numbers, which would make my forecast look a little bit low. So I wasn't very happy about sort of using log normal as the off-the-shelf um, distribution because I think it would make my forecast look um, too short. Uh, what I found is that I found just that the Weeble distribution, which is the one in green, tended to match most of my data sets, mostly. But I wasn't happy with that. I wanted to know why. I, like, if, if it matches one of these mathematical formulas, I should understand as to why that occurs. Um, so I had a look at everyone else's data, and I got access to a lot of data. And what I found is this, is that DevOps teams tend to follow um, what's an exponential distribution. They have, and why is that? Well, it sort of it's about that the person who gets the work can finish it, build a virtual machines, deploy the code. They've done it before, it's either automated and then they're doing it again. It's a very repetitive process. They're always last in the chain, so they don't really rely on a lot of people, but when they do need someone to give them input, they're slow. Now that happens to be also a Weeble distribution with a certain shape parameter. So I'm thinking, okay, so at the DevOps side, I feel that I understand the mechanics of why it matches a Weeble, and I can actually find a Weeble distribution which matches a DevOps team. And as I move to dev teams, they tend to move across to this sort of um, Weeble shape where it's left skewed, um, but still significant values around the 63% mark. And then I found the ones which happen on, uh, which were quoted uh, uh, by Lawrence Putnam and crew back around the 1970s of waterfall teams was a ratty distribution, which also happens to be a Weeble distribution with a certain shape parameter. So I'm sort of finding that most of the distribution types of team types I see follow this shape, and this is why. If you're on an aeroplane flying between two points, there's very little that the pilot can do to pick up time. They might get a little bit of a tailwind, they might be able to just go a bit faster and burn more fuel because they're trying to keep their on-time record intact. Uh, but essentially, think of how many things can go wrong to make your flight late. It could mechanical failure, or weather, uh, ground hold because there's fog at the destination, uh, airport, um, traffic, which means they have to circle before landing. There's a larger number of things that can delay you than can speed you up. And that should sound familiar to development tasks, right? I mean, we we have a rough idea about how we're going to do a task, but there is, depending on how interconnected you are with the rest of your teams, there's um, a lot of um, there's a lot more things that can go wrong. So Weeble distributions are built when you have an amount of work that you know you have to do, plus or minus some tolerance, plus n number of things that can go wrong with a probability of less than one. In other words, some chance of occurring. And just like rolling two six-sided die, there's the triangle distribution. There's a larger number of combinations which uh, add up to uh, six and seven, thank you, than there are actually uh, that uh, add up to uh, two and 12. Well, the same thing happens with odds. Just when a plane takes off, it's unlikely that they have, it's not impossible, it's unlikely that they have um, a weather delay, uh, they have to circle before landing, that they didn't take off on time because of gate hold, because of fog. It's unlikely that all of those occur but it's somewhat likely that at least one of them occur. And if you play out the permutations given that logic, what you end up with is a, is a Weeble distribution. So that means with cycle time, if I know that it's going to follow this shape, all I need to get an estimate of is the minimum and the maximum. And how do I get the minimum and the maximum? How many samples do I need to be 90% sure of the minimum and the maximum? 11 samples. And how many before I'm sort of 80% sure? I need seven samples. So if I can just get people even to guess the maximum that it's ever going to be, or if I can get actual seven samples of real data, I can work out what shape the cycle time is going to be in that process. And that's exactly what I do. 
I actually just used this formula. I just sort of grabbed the upper bound. So I asked them, how long has the longest job ever taken in your team? And they sort of say, oh, one took sort of uh, two and a half months. I used that as the upper bound, and I divide it by four. And that's the distribution that I used. And so far, out of about 10 projects, I've been within about 7% of the actuals by the time I have real data. So the, the rule is, if you have no data or less than 11 samples, then you just sort of say it's going to be between the minimum and the maximum they say. That's the safest bet, but it will give you a long forecast. Or what I just did with that Weeble distribution, I just infer what the cycle time is likely to be. Once I get 11 samples, I check my guess on the range, just using that technique I showed you earlier. Um, I, by 11 samples, I take the minimum and the maximum I've seen, and that's the likely boundaries of between the fifth and the 95th. Uh, prediction interval. And once I get more than 30 samples, I just use their historical data just as samples. I don't even do any inference on what shape it's going to be. So by 30 stories flowing through, you're going to nail the forecast and prediction, and you have a perfect model to do experiments on. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for being here and staying to the end. Um, you get the slides and the software and read these books. Um, questions? Go ahead. You're, uh, you're assuming that the units of work that are then being measured in this forecast are the assumption that it's a similar amount of work each time. You don't have variance, you have the same observance. Yeah. So, so, so where you have projects or situations, thanks. So where you have situations which you have known different sizes flowing through uh, the yeah. work in progress funnel. You're then doing multiple distributions and multiple forecasting exercises, presumably, and layering them up. Yeah, I, I, so the question was, um, how do you account for different size work flowing through? I, I tend to, I, I think it's all those different sizes have probably been encountered historically, and that's why I use the one cycle time distribution and think that the occurrence rate, the probability of them occurring in that set is stronger or weaker depending on how often or frequently you have really hard work or really simple work. So I don't use multiple distributions. I tend to let the one distribution capture all the variance in the system, because there's more variance in the system than there is in the individual piece of work. So that's what you'll see here. You'll see quoted that 5% of 5 to 15% of the time is actually touch time on a story. If you just did a scatter plot of the estimate uh, versus the actual time through the system, you won't find a correlation. You'll find a very weak correlation. And that's because even if you nailed the estimate of the piece of work, you would be nailing how long it took to do 15% of the delivery time, <laughs> which doesn't put the odds in your favor. So what we're trying to do with lead time is capture how long it is through the entire system as a trend, as a, as a distribution. Because um, how long it, it sat in a queue waiting for a test to pick it up has nothing to do with the description of the piece of work. So there's no way, it's unknowable in advance what, that it was going to sit in the testing queue. So it should be obvious that no amount of time spent in a room of highly paid people is going to uncover how that estimate accurately on that piece of work. So I, I, I'm, what I'm doing with the cycle time and the lead time or the process time <laughs> is profiling the, the time through the entire delivery system, not the individual piece of work. What I'm using the individual pieces of work for as a count is how much of that's going to occur. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. And thanks to Matt, sound guy, and sorry, who's the guy on camera? Paul. Paul on camera, Matt on sound. Thank does, you. Does your model take account of the stochastic nature of things? My experience is that if you're modeling what a team's doing and they're halfway through, there's kind of a tipping point. And some teams, when they carry on at that point, will carry on and things will be fine. But other teams will get totally in a disaster because they've got huge amounts of technical debt building up, for example. Yeah. And effectively, it could go one way and it could go the other way. But yep. it's very hard to know which way it's going to go. Yep. So the, question, the, the comment is, is exactly right. Um, at every point in time, you don't know which direction it's going to head. If you toss a coin and you added one if it turned out on a head or minus one if it turned out on a tail, you'll find that it ends up following a random walk. It doesn't actually go plus or minus the axis very often. 
and actually moves away. And that's what happens in teams. They, they, have a, they hit a story which is significantly harder, and that puts them further behind. You never get that time back. Uh, so you actually do move away. It's not, now, it's not that it's harder, it's that it's later. It's later, yeah. Okay, because right. they have to accumulate, they have to cope with not only the thing they're working on working, but also not breaking the things that already exist. Yeah, that's right. So what he's saying is cycle time to the end of the project could get longer because you've added technical debt. So by the time when that's happening, you should see an increase in cycle times, but a stable whip. And that's your indication that it's getting harder to put the same amount of work through the system. And that's, your, that's how you can put a dollar value on technical debt. If you hold whip constant, but your cycle time's increasing, you're growing technical debt in your project. And now you can sort of say, if we did go down 10% by addressing this technical debt, it shaves a month off the project, which is worth $1.14 million. So now you can actually get someone to help do the, doing, you build a case for economically refactoring because it is economically viable to do. There's a great point. What you're looking for is how those three elements, the whip, cycle time, and the amount of work is changing. And they're all related through Little's Law. So you understand throughput, and if some are staying the same, you, you need to understand why the others aren't changing. So Google Little's Law, but a great comment. Um, it's, the first time I was able to put a dollar value on technical debt, I did cartwheels. Uh, because I know it was, uh, as, a, as a developer, it was really hard to sell refactoring and addressing technical debt. So being able to put a dollar figure on it is golden. Hi. So uh, two questions. So are you, is your message then that we should stop doing estimation and stop doing burn charts, burn down charts? And secondly, is there any plans or does it exist in a product form, this, this type of forecasting? Um, uh, yeah, so I answer the second question. Yes, at that bit.ly agile sim, you can download the software for free now to do everything I've shown you on the screen and to do this yourself. Um, it's built into some of the products. It's built into Linkit now. Linkit mines your data behind the scenes and build the model and uh, gives you forecasts and sensitivity based on your project. Um, Digite have uh, built some of this sort of technology into their system as well to do this forecasting. So should you stop estimation completely? No, you shouldn't. I, I think, though, I don't think we're estimating the right things. I think estimating how long it's going to take to do a piece of work or sizing a piece of work might be optimizing something which doesn't play a major role in the output. So I think we should be estimating how much work is involved when certain risks come true or what the impact is of... Um, technical debt growing, or what's our defect rate? Let's work out strategies for halving the rate that we introduce defects into our software process. Um, I think there is definitely a case at times where you have no option but to forecast a completion date and the amount of staff you need to do it. Uh, but I also think that varies. If you can't change staff and you're gonna be told what piece of work's gonna do next and it, it has to be done, there's no need to estimate. So that decision tree I did at the start, it's completely contextual to your situation. You need to think about it. Um, but do I think that estimating the amount of time in story points for a piece of work is a good use of developer's time? I do not. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, thank you, guys. I'll be at a bar somewhere across the road from the Pullman for quite a number of hours from now. Um, thank you. Thank you.